three yeah. and then I actually tipped myself Sorry, into a fourth one. Yeah. Sorry so about that, that. So that's that's what I did, Jeff, and that's why I didn't put a target in. Um, and that's that the answer I expected. Thanks. Thanks. All good. Yeah. Just just um, I'm not very trusting. <laughs> Look, uh, Angie, Jordan, come in the room. Let's go. To, let's go to Jordan, and we'll come back, and we'll finish goal when when yep. we've, we've got through our, our four counts of peers with him, or four, four topics with him. Jordan, welcome along. How are you doing? Hey, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. How are we all? Hi. Uh, good. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, leave that chart up. I think it's a good chart. If you wouldn't mind just making it, this is a little bit too too short a time frame for me. If you wouldn't mind just making it a weekly chart, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> So I'm going to start with an anecdote. Um, actually, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'll start with what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about is my general context about where I feel markets are at the moment. And then we'll try and be a little bit more specific about trying to think about how we're going to trade this going forward for the next few days. So um, I'll start with the anecdote. The anecdote was I went to a broker evening um, the, uh, about three or four days ago on Tuesday. And uh, the boss of the brokerage, we were chatting because um, we're quite good friends. And um, we were chatting and he said to me that um, um, pretty much all of his foreign exchange clients have stopped trading foreign exchange and now will trade gold. So I said to him, so now they all trade gold when gold is at $2,000 an ounce. I don't recall them ever. Was the same thing true when gold was $1,100 an ounce? And um, he started laughing and said, well, no, of course not, because it wasn't popular back then. <laughs> So one of the really interesting things contextually is that um, when everybody runs to one side of the boat, I start to get really interested in that particular market because it's, it suggests that there's a opportunity for what may be a very high reward to risk um, potential reversal trade. So what I've been looking for for the past three or four weeks is not what's been happening, but what's going to happen. And I absolutely get the breakout. It clearly is an uptrend. And I've been part of that as well, too, in some of my trading and my thinking. Um, I think I've got to revise my expectations based upon the fact that possibly this is a shine boy moment. Um, now, does that mean to say that I'm getting bearish of gold forever? No. Does it mean to say that if you look at all the previous rallies that gold has had over the course of the last 40 to 50 years, um, in terms of uh, explosive breakout moves, um, we're average for time, but we've done better in percentage terms than pretty much all of them. So the um, what that tells me from a cycle perspective is that um, we're due for something to change. Now, when that has happened, the corrective element here is uh, normally quite strong. And it's not unusual to find a correct a correction which may go 20%. Um, that, that means, as I'm sure you guys are aware, that there's potential here for a $400 decline back to, I guess, somewhere in the $1,600 mark as a, potential, as a potential area. I would use that as a buy point because I'm still quite bullish on gold long term. But as everybody knows, I've been, this is like a broken record now for the last two years I've been. Um, but I do feel that we've, that we're getting close to um, the um, uh, the end of what is this most recent move. Now that doesn't mean to say that you know we go let's all go out and sell it on Monday morning. That isn't what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about contextually is there's something going on in gold that means time's up. Now when I look at the dollar index as well too, and I look at the euro and the commitment of traders report and some of the sentiment in that as well too, trying to find a bear on the euro is really hard. Um, I know that one or two of the traders here are starting to question the uh, the, the bull run here. Um, but generally speaking out there, there's a lot of bullish sentiment towards the euro. There's tremendous bearish sentiment towards the dollar index. And I don't think anybody would criticize the EU if you said I'm bullish on Aussie and bullish on Kiwi. So really, the question is, um, if the sentiment is so one sided right now, is there an opportunity for us to reverse it? <laughs> And when we look at gold, and we look at gold, maybe if you now go down to that four hourly chart that Ainsley had up a second ago, Paul, if that would be possible, please. Um, we now have a, uh, a slightly different way of thinking for me in terms of I'm, 
Uh, the issue for me is really straightforward. If the correction comes, is it going to be a, um, if you like, a V-shaped or pyramid style correction where it goes up and then just utterly reverses in everybody's face? Or is it going to be a more protracted consolidation in gold and it just goes sideways for a little while? Well, I think my, my tentative answer to that is I suspect it's going to be more violent. Um, and also from a seasonality perspective, gold normally is, um, is quite bullish around this time of year and through to like the end of September. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say there aren't corrections. So I would view the corrections as being quite hard and quite fast, especially given the sentiment that's out there. So, um, but that doesn't stop the medium term bull picture. It also doesn't stop the medium term bear picture all unfolding uh, in line with what we're expecting. So um, for my own thesis that I'm working on at the moment, uh, I don't believe Friday afternoon sell-off. I don't know if anybody's said that yet. I think um, uh, Friday afternoon sell-offs are just rubbish. Um, they don't really prove anything. They normally uh, don't work, especially outside uh, outside days that are created as a result of that Friday afternoon sell-off. I'd probably be a buyer um, on Monday morning, uh, looking to try and make some money out of that uh, from, uh, uh, if you like, an on-trend trade. And we, we do have that outside bar is that a weekly? That's that. That's a daily, right? We do have that outside bar in gold pitched up, but most of that outside bar occurred over a course of a um, three to four hour trading session on Friday afternoon. So am I discounting it? No. Am I saying there's something more important that could be at play here? No. Am I saying it's a buy on Monday? Probably yes. So the the um, I don't believe that outside day has the validity which you'd normally ascribe to outside days um, at the top of trends. Now, if you go and look at a um, at the Kiwi, please, Paul, uh, Dollar Kiwi. Johnny, can I ask you a question? Yep. Can I, before before we go, can I just can I just draw this up and see if I've got this right? What we're really looking for here is um, if I can make this uh, this work. So we're looking for a move up, but then we're just looking for it to pull back and give us a higher low. We might have a little look on the downside as well, right? So it's initially up, but we're looking for not just a seller, but we're looking for some kind of confirmation of weakness to sell into, right? Mm, yep. Great. Onto the Kiwi. And if you um, put up the weekly chart on the Kiwi, please. The mighty Kiwi, the greatest uh, currency pair of them all. Just ask Paul Hutton, he'll tell you he agrees. Let's start with a weekly for our, for our, for our analysis. Well, this has put a ringed high in place on the weekly, right? Yeah, look, interesting too. And look, I wouldn't mind blowing up and have a look at this, but, you know, and, 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 you know, I know that people use different things, but it's, you know, I'm going to call that, and, and this is this is a little controversial, but I'm going to call that, uh, this has put a ring high and bouncing off the 200 day moving average. And I know it doesn't touch it, but I'm going to suggest that in uh, a non a non centralized market that's close enough to suggest that it's touched on somebody's, on somebody's brokerage. Uh, interesting place for, inter interesting place for a move down. Yeah, and then if you put the daily chart up, Paul, you can see how this week the Kiwi has, um, you might need to squash it, I thank you, that's that's perfect. You can see how the Kiwi put a um, put an initial top in place, was that last week? Uh, no, that had been the week before, Friday the week before. Um, that put an initial top in place there on that bar, yep, and then we had, we spent the most of last week working our way back towards that high and then rejected it, so... That to me is a sign that possibly there's something going on. Uh, at, on, in other words, it rejected the uh, the retest of the highs, and now there may be a new trend beginning to start. So that's one of the clearer examples of what the context is that I'm talking about here. Um, if you also look around the other markets, so for instance, copper had a terrible day on Friday. Um, there were a number of commodities that got annihilated on Friday: uh, copper, aluminium. The list sort of goes on. You can look at a few of those. And they all had that same Friday afternoon sell-off feel about it, which what's again the, uh, is... It, uh, what's the ticket for copper? Um, so it's uh, XCU, I think it may be. XCU, there we go. Keep going down. That one. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> did have a little, little roll out on Friday afternoon, didn't it? So if you then pull that out to a weekly chart, Paul... Right, now you get some perspective about what's going on, right? So this is a massive uptrend in line with a restart of global demand. And now we're questioning that 
size of up move. We're not necessarily questioning the up move, we're questioning the size of the up move, so make it more corrective. So there's what I'm worried about, and I've probably gone over time here, so I'll stop talking now. What I'm worried about is the fact that this is the same in every single market. Doesn't that look a bit like the S&P? Doesn't that look a bit like the Euro? Doesn't that look a bit like, I don't know, pick anything, the Kiwi, the Aussie? And this is copper, right? They're all the same. Guys, the whole world has the same trade on. It's, um, and particularly the NASDAQ as well, right, which, which is the same thing, really. It just started, to fall, oh, just started to fall away a little bit. Yeah, the NASDAQ does fit into the camp of um, global, global funny man at the moment. Um, but, yeah. So the, my basic thesis here is, is it time that we're calling an end to some of this stuff? The extreme positioning we're seeing on the commitment of traders in both the euro and the Aussie and the Kiwi and also the dollar index suggests that there's a potential reversal coming on weekly bar charts. So, um, again, I'm not saying that it's going to go down Monday. I'm just saying this is you're on full alert now for potential reversal. The question in my mind is what is that reversal going to look like and where is it going to be the most dramatic? You know, we saw a big move in copper there. Um, and the reason why we saw a big move in copper is that topped out first, right? So interestingly, interestingly, because that's moved first, does that mean to say that other things are going to catch up? Maybe a daily chart might be a slightly better one to look at for that one. So um, the, that consolidated for three weeks before it began to break down. So there's your consolidation and then breakdown phase. Am I saying that that's going to happen in gold and or the euro and or the kiwi whatever 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 right uh, and the short answer is i don't think it is i think there's something more violent going to happen in those so there's my thesis that's what i'm working on for the next um the next couple of weeks and we'll see how it plays out julian how do they um look um, how, how do um how do how do our people look to take advantage of this and look um Let's go back onto uh, a currency for a second and have a look at uh, the Kiwi again. Let's go back up and have a look at that, right? Um, so looking for New Zealand dollar, we've seen this. Um, look, I, I haven't even moved my, 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 my square, but, you know, it, it sort of basically is the same place, you know, I can. <laughs> well, ironically, it almost is, actually. It really is, you know. And, and, and you know, so what we're seeing here is that uh, we're seeing these consolidations. And look, um, you know, how, how do you how do you trade these? And, um you know, the, the first thing for mine is that, you know, if I was trading this, I probably wouldn't be buying the bottom of the range and going to the top anymore. I'd probably be selling the top of the range and coming to the bottom. I might just yes. have a bit of a bias where I'm a bit interested on, on selling here and I'm not so interested in buying down here. At the All same right. time, what we're really looking for is this, right? We just need to see this, put a lower low, pull back to a lower high, and this goes from being a thesis to something that's actionable. Until then, it's, it's as you, you keep calling it your, your, your thesis for the week, right? You're not going to do anything with this until a chart tells you you're right, right? No, exactly. So if you go down to a 240 minute bar, actually even an hourly chart on that, an hourly chart, but a four hourly chart might be better, actually. Sorry, let's try four hourly. Okay, here we go. So it's the size for hourly bar, isn't it? Yeah. So let's say, right, that until proved otherwise, this is the new trend. Yep. So then it's a question of how do we trade the tre the the retracement? Because we know that Friday afternoon bollocks usually gets waxed on Monday, right? So if this is a, and I apologize for my language, everybody, uh, if, if this is a, um, a Friday afternoon rubbish trade, then we will have the opportunity to be able to put short positions on at better levels than where the market closed out on Friday. Yeah. So then the question that we have is to figure out what those levels are. Now, it doesn't take a... Um, <laughs> thank you thank you Helen I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that YouTube sometimes agrees with us um so the um the the issue in my mind is somewhere in here is going to be the next cell the question is where so it wouldn't be unreasonable if you could uh, pull draw some support lines probably around about or resistance lines around about 66 30 would be a good starting point <laughs> um and as I say to people all the time with this uh if you Keep going about 66.30, right? So there we go. Um, that's quite important. Maybe a little bit lower than that, a little bit higher than that. So somewhere between 66.20 and 66.40 
is a level at which you're going to want to think of exactly you're going to want to think about participating right where you manage the risk is you say if we get above 6650 something like that that may be a point of which i question my short-term sell idea for this particular trade Nice. Right, so we've had a. Um, so we're, we're going to open the. Um, <clears throat> we're going to open the uh, the week on monthly pivot, and uh, you know I think every chance here, as you say, Friday bollocks will be done, and we'll be bouncing back up into these areas, and then looking for some price action here that encourages us to make a decision. And if we get the right price action, look, it's one percent. Don't waste ten percent on it, but you can see if you can find a way in. One of the things about um, moves you're talking about here, Julian, these could be um, these could be temporary corrections. These could be quite big moves, and I think one of the things for new traders to understand is that. You don't have to rush risk into big moves. You don't. You didn't have to get gold at sixteen hundred. You just had to get gold on the way. You don't have to rush into this stuff. You can take your time and let let these pictures get clearer, and 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 you know, and take positions along the journey. You don't have to be at the start, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And look, yes, Paul, exactly. And Helen's raised a really interesting issue, which sort of answers the question as well. Right, so there's two things you've got to understand here, Helen, is that I, I'm, I'm moving across time frames in my conversation. So, Paul, if you wouldn't mind putting the gold chart up again. You know, I will not take a selling gold that I'm looking for a $200 move um, on based on an hourly chart. That doesn't make any sense at all, right? Well, it does, I guess, if the volatility is high enough, but it isn't. Um, we haven't got that sort of crazy volatility here. So if we're going to have a correction... The average correction, given the distance that we've traveled, right? The average correction is around about 20%. I would be expect that to happen between now and December. Okay, that's quite a long time away, right? So when we say, when I say, what does violent mean? Or you ask me what violent means, my worry and my worry wart to all of this is there's so much sentiment right now in the gold market so much sentiment that um, this could be a very violent and fast correction just because nobody is bearish. And so therefore it keeps going down and down and down and down and down. And every time people try and buy it, which is what they've done in the past, they get stopped out again and again and again until they figure out that it's actually a downtrend now. So our job as traders is to try and look for a change of state. Now, when that normally tends to happen these days, you don't, people's opinion is so, um, the sentiment is so important at the moment that I don't think you're going to have a consolidative phase. I would really like there to be one where we go and we retest the high and we muck around. It gives us a couple of opportunity to get short and things like that. Yeah, that would be good. There'd be some warning signs in there, but I think it, and that would be a great way of doing it. But that would be almost too easy for the new traders who have started to trade gold. So I don't think they're going to get that. They're going to get that um, nice and easy place, right? Um, <laughs> so the um, the thing for me is, and what I'm concerned about is when sentiment is so extreme as it is right now that the corrective moves happen in a very fast way, and that's what I mean by violent. So when we talk about Friday bollocks, Julian, what we're really saying is that late on a Friday afternoon, um, volume in, in the market can thin out a little bit. You've got people who are trying to close positions they've been in through the week. They don't want to hold them through weekends. And quite often you see a counter move at the end of a Friday, and it doesn't mean a hell of a lot at times. There's not enough, there's not enough volume there later on Friday uh, to, to really hold it together, and we don't take these moves. That if the same move happened on a Thursday, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'd be saying, look, this is an outside day down at the top of a range, and we need to be seriously short. But because it's Friday, we go, oh, well, it's probably just a bit of a market correction kind of stuff going on. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Um, Friday afternoon in summertime is exactly what it is. <laughs> There's nobody in the office. <laughs> yeah, most, most, most traders on Friday afternoon are, are not at their desk trading. They're in a bar somewhere talking bollocks to somebody else, you know. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so these we markets... Have a word of the day. <laughs> junior, junior traders. Junior, junior traders, are um, the volume's down and moves can be quite quick. And you know, a lot of uh, position traders, a lot of funds, they don't like to hold positions over weekends. So quite often on a Friday afternoon late, you'll see an opposite move to the rest of the week when people who have gone long just close out positions and banks and profit before they go to the weekend. 
apart from anything else, it means that these guys can go away with a clear head for the weekend, not have this stuff, you know, bubbling around in the head over the weekend. I think it's not a bad idea in today's world to close, close trades over weekend. Julian, is that you for today? Yeah, pretty much, Paul. Mate, can I just invite anyone from the team with any questions? Anyone from the team? Yeah, really I'm, I'm, check the yes, Jeff. Just the one. RBNZ on Wednesday. Cut and paste. No real surprises. And if so, what so? Um, you're asking for our opinion on that. Uh, I think they'd like to raise, they'd like to cut interest rates to zero permanently for the next two years. Okay, so that goes along with the thesis. Those, um, those, those employment numbers, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think there's. Um, I've heard the talk in the market here that the they want to move to negative interest rates if possible, but they can't do it because one of the banks hasn't got the systems to do it, and they're trying to fix that. Um, so they can't move uh, interest rates into negative territory if required. So they'll be stuck at zero for longer. Wow. Okay. Um, the initial is is <laughs> is is more complex than the the afterthought. The um the thing with that, uh, Jeff, is that if they do that, then we are looking to uh, this 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 the uh, the topping out of the Kiwi dollar really supports that. That's a view that's held by a few people. Hmm. Oh, someone, yeah, someone somewhere is um someone somewhere is, is tipping that the uh, RBNZ at some point is going to get a bit more bearish on interest rates. The fascinating stuff for me. Somebody lives here. I'm, I'm you know, it's a place that's pretty busy uh, in New Zealand. Gosh, well, I do want to uh, appreciate the question, Jeff. Um, I do want to um, just pass on to the re people around the rest of the world to listen to this. As somebody who lives in New Zealand, I really hope the New Zealand example is what's coming for you guys. Since COVID has left these shores, money has come flying into businesses. People are shopping local, people are traveling local, and people are spending money in ways I don't think we've seen in New Zealand for a little while. I think they, you know, they're actually, we're, um, in a way, New Zealand talks about the team of five million who 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 did the hardest quarantine I've ever seen. People talk about quarantine. I, when they tell when they tell us about their quarantine, I laugh. So that's not what we did here. We just didn't go anywhere but the supermarket. It was different. But not only that, but the team of five million is now consciously out spending money to try and support the economy. It's quite an interesting thing to watch. And um, there may be some good news coming out of this for countries that might be a little bit better than people are expecting. I hope. I can't say that's an economic opinion, but it's certainly a Certainly a hope of what we're seeing uh, from here. One final thought, Julian, anything from you? Yeah, I've just, uh, just to answer um, Helen's question, if I may be um, so bold on this, I think everybody, there is a point at which private traders feel they're always on the outside looking in. And um, can I just say that uh, the concept of this being some kind of pre-planned institutional dump on gold on Friday is, just, I, you know, I don't quite understand that question and I often see these things and I and I hear words like manipulation and I hear other things like that and honestly in in 95 percent of the markets that we trade out there no one individual organization is sufficiently large enough to have any material difference um, short term they may be able to impact the price over the course of an hour or so but realistically in something like gold or definitely in any of the foreign exchange markets to imply that anyone in the, where one or organization has any type of significant influence is just not true at all. The yeah, volumes yeah. are way, 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 way bigger. And quite frankly, you know, there's a lot of rules in place that prevent people from doing that. Look, you know, um, there's always, as, as long as you're in the game, there'll be a conspiracy theory, theory around. And look, in my opinion, um, and, and this is only my opinion, but, as a trader, you need to ignore that stuff and focus on the charts and making good decisions because even if you're right, you can't do anything about it, you know, and you're probably yeah. not right. And the market will just behave in the way it behaves and you just need to be, you know, get, get on with that, you know? Yeah, and, and, and look, there's a lot of people go, oh, the Fed's defending the stock market and stuff like that. Seriously, the Fed can't buy stocks. And <laughs> it's like... Um, what the Fed can do and has been doing, and the reason why the stock market has been rallying so much in specifically the US over the course of the last six months since March, is the Fed has been buying all the junk bonds of the companies that are on the stock market. Yeah. And if you buy those bonds and you guarantee the maturity cycle because you're buying those bonds, right, and so you're buying them at whatever price they are, and you're going to hold them to maturity, in which case that company is going to be good on the debt, right? 
then why wouldn't the share price go up? Because that's the last leverage point in the in the capital structure of the firm. It's it's that's pretty straightforward. And what the Fed is also doing in buying those assets, be they bonds or be they um, a mortgage REITs or whatever the hell else they happen to buy, when they're buying all of those things, what they're doing is they're crushing volatility. And a decline in volatility means that most asset allocation firms, because of the way in which they run, their risk parity allocation on the vast majority of their funds means the lower the volatility in that particular market sector, the more they have to buy of it. So as volatility falls out of the market, more people have to come in to buy. And so that creates the run on the way up and it also creates the fall on the way down. So as volatility rises, then people are forced to allocate away from that asset class as well, too. That's why we have under and over shooting. So when you just see the stock market rising and rising and rising and you're scratching your head going, it makes no sense economically for this to be happening. Just remember, sometimes the stock market is divorced from what's going on economically. This happens from time to time. This is another one of those events when it's happening, right? We're in the midst of a bubble and that bubble is in stocks. If you don't want to, if you don't understand that we're in a the bubble, then please go and look at that NASDAQ chart that Paul maybe had up earlier, which says we've gone up nearly 100% since March. If you, you, you can't tell me that since the, bottom of, since the bottom of the market in March and now, four months later, that the world is in a better place outside. It's got nothing to do with that and got everything to do with the fact the Fed is selling volatility. And you could, that's maybe a conspiracy or not, but it's just a fact, right? And that's, um, that's just what's happening. When you, when you sort of get that, then it makes life a little bit easier because you understand what's going on. And um, interestingly enough, the NASDAQ is underperforming now because the volatility in that market is the worst. If you go and look at the Dow or the S&P over the course of the last few weeks, Paul, if you keep that chart and then look at the Dow and the S&P, you'll see how volatility has exited the market. It's got a little bit quieter. What one's that one? Is that the Dow? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of open and closes together, right? Lots of times when the market hasn't done much during that week. And so... And with the same with the S and P as well too, right? The volatility is coming out of the market, and therefore people buy more of it, and that's really what's going on. Julian, can I jump in for a second here? A couple, just sure. a couple of things to Tom. So, look, if you find the economics of this to be um, overwhelming, then just listen for a few, a, a little while to the show, and then the stuff will get clearer and clearer for you guys. We talked about the uh, the volatility um, stuff uh, two or three times in the last couple of months. We talked about how it's affecting people buying and selling the S and P. Um, just a, a quick comment on the economics for mine, and I do need to move along, but for me, the best thing a central bank can do at the moment is buy company debt because um, uh, the whole notion where the Reserve Bank lends the money to the government and the government may or may not pay it back, that's got no wheels. They, they can't work long term. But if you're buying corporate bonds, eventually that money does get paid back. And it's a far safer intervention from a central bank than what they're doing uh, with, with standard quantum of easing. So I... I think it's New Zealand, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is doing it. And I think it's, a, it's, it's the right way to do it is actually just to, to come into these markets and to stabilize these um, companies by, by buying their debts. Um, and uh, because that is going to get repaid. Yeah, exactly, Paul. And look, just taking that stage further, just bear in mind that there is not a single um, economist out there who has any idea what's going on. Oh. Right. This is a new brand of economics that we're experiencing now. Right. This is the economics where debt is now so overwhelming, but they're going to continue to continue to expand it that, yeah, you could argue eventually something has to break. We all get that. But the point is trying to make good economic analysis in here and tie stock markets to the economy and things like that. It just doesn't make any sense. And it hasn't made any sense for a while. So there's this is the reason why you're seeing a lot of. Um, the sky is falling comments from economists. So one of the interesting things about the uh, New Zealand employment numbers out this week was because they came in crazy good, right? They were like uh, four or five percent, I think, versus the expectations yeah. of eight percent, which were ridiculous. That's like a miss by three percent. OK, economists <laughs> can't possibly miss that far. Right. Everybody got it wrong. And why did they get it wrong? Now, there may be some technicals as to why they got it wrong. And even one of the economists said, well, it doesn't matter because I'm going to be right eventually on this. I'm going, well, hang on a second. You call you called for the sky to fall and it isn't falling. So maybe you need to think about it right, in a different way. Right. And maybe you need to think about, well, maybe this has worked. Um, but again, because it doesn't fit their economic models, then people get nervous about it. And that's part of the problem. 
right? There is no model out there that's going to tell you what the answer is right now, because this is the biggest shutdown in output that the world's ever experienced, short of a war. So to try and say that I understand what's happening is ridiculous, and nobody does. So you just then, then work your way backwards to say, I'll tell you what we'll do here is that we'll trade the price action and we'll try and trade it as we see it. And uh, that's why I'm interested in maybe a potential reversal coming up over the next few weeks, regardless of whatever happens to the economy. I suspect the economies of the world might well get better. And as a result of that, um, the stock market may go down. Well, you try and figure that one out. Well, it's not worth it. So why worry? Right, yeah, guys. Um, Jordan, thank you very much. Look, guys, it's um, one of the things that we look to do is we bring different experts in and some of the stuff, um, I'm really interested to know whether that some of it is a, bit, is a bit tough for new people to understand or not, but just keep listening. It'll get clearer and clearer. And look, I, I think it's a really good point that Julie makes. And again, I don't want to, we've, we've got to get around everybody else as well, but I think at the moment, um, economists are trying to make stuff up to make themselves feel relevant because really they don't know and no one knows. We all have opinions, but no one knows. And again, Will there be some conspiracy theories out there in the next uh, two or three years? One thing I will agree, I think you said this as well, Julian, that um, right now is the time when governments and reserve banks have to be doing this. Yeah, that totally. Whether it's, whether it's right or wrong, right now they've got to try it because if they don't try it, we're going back to the 1930s. And um, yeah, that, exactly that is like not that. an option for us. You know? No, no, d don't get me wrong on this. There's absolutely, I'm the most liberal market, one of the most liberal market people you're going to find. But there are times when the central banks and the governments absolutely have to do what they've done. Don't worry about what they've done. Be thankful that we have people in, in control and people who are running the economy, the government that actually recognise that this was a needed thing to have happen. They, I'm sure they've all done it wrong. I'm sure they've all got the basic gist of it dead right. But this, so everybody focuses on the semantics, which may be which may be wrong at the time, but. The overall thrust of what the governments have done is exactly what they should have done, given a, a global pandemic that, quite frankly, was handled brilliantly by Asia and handled appallingly by the rest of the world. And um, the, the, you know, you've really got to wonder, the Chinese must be scratching their heads some days, wondering what the hell's going on, because they absolutely got it 110 percent right. Um, they've seen it before, they reacted quickly, they locked down and it wasn't a problem. And yet look at what's going on elsewhere. And it's enough of a head scratcher just to listen to the headlines coming out of the States that I've now stopped doing it because it's just hilarious. And I look Sorry, at what New Zealand's done and I'm very, and I'm very, very, very thankful. So, um, you know, it's, that, might uh, the, that might be the only political thing we're going to say on this show about New Zealand where you and I agree. Very, very <laughs> thankful. And um, we did have, you know, some people did some really good stuff. Jordan, I've got to move it along as always. Thank Sorry, you very guys. much. Uh, fascinating stuff. And, you know, I think there's some people listening to this that, um, I, I listen to this and going, wow, that clears some stuff up. And there'll be some people who um, listen to this going, wow, that, that's that's quite quite deep and it's quite deep. But it's the kind of stuff, if you're going to trade, you want to hang around and learn uh, some more from because, you know, uh, we're, we're very lucky to have people come in and talk this kind of stuff uh, for us and give a look at what's going on in the back rooms of all this kind of stuff. The bank in New Zealand that can't run negative interest rates, that is third world. That is not sounding quite so cool. Cheers, Fad. Thanks for the feedback, mate. Much appreciated. Rightio, we are going to go uh, to ping that.